Our second goal is to expose the works of darkness, starting with entertainment, a device the devil uses to control your mind and soul. Why? Why? Because these are the subjects that are interwoven into a lot of your entertainment. Don't let them burn. This is Chris from Don't Let Them Burn. Welcome to our review of Avengers Endgame. Now remember, this is a Christian movie review. So if you get offended very easily, it's time to back out. And if you haven't seen the movie and get offended at spoilers, it's time to back out. I'm joined with Kevin Trum again. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Chris. It's always an honor and privilege to be with you on your show. And uh, as you said, this, this in-game movie, it's sort of, I guess, the climax of a, you know a 11-year Marvel run. And uh, boy, they, uh, they take this uh, phase three out in style. Oh, yeah. And for those that don't know, if you haven't seen the first movie, we'll, we'll recap it for you a little bit. The first uh, movie, well, I say the first movie is really the 21st movie in 10 years, uh, which was Avengers Infinity War. And it was basically the culmination of all the movies since Iron Man 1. Now, in this movie, we had what they call, you know, it was a heist movie. And they were searching for all of the Infinity Stones, which are like living beings but you know they encapsulate them into stone or whatever that's the, in the, from the creation and the comic books they were like living beings since the creation of the of the universe now these stones can be put inside of a gauntlet to give a person or a being godlike powers and thanos who is the angel of death or it can be seen as an allegory for someone wanting to become like god or god himself or whatever however you want to look at it and he, he's, uh, he's been on this search for these stones for uh, centuries. And now in this movie, Avengers Infinity War, he gets to receive all the stones by obviously stealing them. And then he does this thing called the snap, which takes away half of the universe. Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you got that and hit that nail on the head. You know, Marvel here, they present, Thanos as the angel of death and as God himself. And, you know, as this movie, uh, you know, you sit back and watch this movie, it, it goes in so many directions and there's so many themes and underlying storylines, you know, tied in with this movie. You know, we could probably make four or five shows and really just scratch the surface on it. Yeah, that's, that's actually true. And just to, you know, hit a couple more beats on the first movie, the, the first movie was uh, basically about the rapture but told in a different fashion. This great event that, that's coming in, it's imminent. Um, and it, it can happen at any time, biblically. We see is taken from the Bible and put into a comic book. This story called the Infinity Gauntlet, and it, and they had its run, right? And it, even even in that comic book, they had terms like, uh, like say, Thor's father, you know, Odin's son, uh, he said, was wearing a ceremonial eye patch of sorrow, and he said that, uh, half of my civilization was basically uh, disappeared in the twinkling of an eye. That's rapture terms, you know? So this is a direct take from the Bible, but turned into, you know, fantasy or whatever. And if you didn't see Avengers Infinity War decoded, you might want to go back because we laid out a, a lot of things in that, in that um, uh, review that you might want to go back and listen to so it connects everything. So just real quick, I want to interject there. You know, you know, folks might think we might be stretching that point, but Glenn Weldon, he coined the term snapshot when he wrote a review for NPR on Infinity War. So even secular, you know, like movie reviewers are seeing the, I guess you could say, the similarity between the rapture and Infinity War. Yeah, exactly. And for people that don't know, and meaning if you're not a Christian or if you're a Christian and you haven't heard of the rapture before... It's really the rapture of the church, not the rapture of half of the universe or half of the planet. I don't even think it'll be half gone, but that's not for me to know. That's for God to know. So we're just putting things in context for you. And we'll probably bring back something that we mentioned in our review of Infinity War that will give you some idea of the rapture. Yes, it's taken from the Bible and also the New Age have been channeling spirits because they know it's coming, and they have their own terminology for it. So, but before we get into that, this movie has been one of the 
most massive cultural events as far as entertainment goes, or when I say entertainment, I mean movies, that since the first movie last year. Before that, it was Avatar, you know, and it, everyone went out to see this, you know. I, I believe that even churches bought their groups to go see this, right? And this is not yeah. a Christian film, by the way. So um, now this movie has, it made $2 billion in the first two weeks. And right now it's sitting at $2.7 billion. And it's been out for about a month now, um, 43 days to be exact. And now that's a little behind what Avatar made. Avatar made worldwide $2.787 billion. And Infinity War is at $2.722 billion. So just to put that in contrast for you, you understand this, this is a huge cultural movement. And everyone's talking about it. You see memes everywhere, uh, even from the first movie. So, And this is the 11th year in... Gematria, the 11th year, is a symbol of crisis. And in this movie, all we see is the result of the first crisis. Like we said, it's, this is uh, basically how are these superheroes who failed to stop this rapture-like event from happening? How are they coping with it? They're coping with it in sorrow, not knowing where to go. Uh, certain characters are... are like Thor, are feeling their failure and going into depression and alcoholism. And so as we move into this movie, step by step, you'll see that everything that we're going to say is accurate. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, you have, as you mentioned, you have, a, uh, you have it laid out where, I guess, when uh, Ant-Man uh, returns uh, from the microverse there, and uh, he, we see he's going around and of course he runs into the little boy there on the bicycle and he doesn't know what's going on. And he goes on, he finds the, uh, memorial that's dedicated, uh, I guess you, to the vanished is what they call the people that have disappeared, the vanished memorial. And we can see as he's, he's looking through the L's on the, on the, uh, stones there, which to me are very reminiscent of the Georgia guide stones, but he's looking through the names. Of course, he spots his own name there. And uh, we can just see that, you know, over a course of five years, uh, the people are still sort of in shock, as we can see, and they still not really went on with their lives. Yeah, exactly. And the movie starts out now by Hawkeye having a kind of training session with his daughter, and he sends her to do something, and when he turns around, she's gone. Yeah. And then he turns around to his wife and his son, and they're gone. And that leads him on a tirade uh, later on in the movie that, that we'll talk about in a minute. But, uh, yeah, so but before we get to the Ant-Man scene, we have where um, all the, 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 the remaining Avengers, they are basically, um, and, and some of the Wakandans and Captain Marvel, uh, we see that they are dealing with this. And, um, you know, I, I kind of jumped ahead there. <laughs> Tony Stark and Nebula are stuck in outer space from the last movie when they left the planet Titan, which is uh, Thanos' home planet, which they had the battle, which they were left. They couldn't basically escape. But they got off. Uh, both of them were the last two left on that planet when the snap happened. And we see that basically Tony's at the end of his life and um, he's leaving a message for his wife and basically is ready to go off into sleep to die. And lo and behold, here comes this fairy-looking person, Captain Marvel, Queen of Heaven, and uh, she brings them back to Earth. <laughs> she brings them back to Earth, and uh, basically now they're they're trying to gather, see if if they could come up with some plan. But Tony Stark is in bad shape. He curses out Captain America, and basically telling him, you know I needed you before, and uh, I didn't have any help from you. So and then he, he collapses, and so from there. The remaining Avengers and Captain Marvel now, because she was going to go off and kill Thanos herself because she's such a hero and supposed to be one of the most powerful beings in the galaxy, wants to go kill Thanos herself. But what happens is they basically all go together to this planet, which is called the Garden. After Thanos takes away half the life in the universe, he goes to the place reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. I'm pretty sure that's what they're alluding to. But is he takes a rest. This is his Sabbath, right? Right. And he uses the stones 
as he says, to destroy the stones. And uh, the, the Avengers are questioning him about it because they really want the stones. They want the gauntlet. And they see the gauntlet still ha- doesn't have a stone in it there after they attack him. And they basically kill him to keep the story short here. Right? So now, five years later, as the movie tells us, we see the heroes back on Earth. Um, and they, they're, they're arranging themselves in this uh, kind of holographic chat room. And we see that different things are going around across the planet. And one of the most significant parts in this scene right here is that um, Okoye from um, Wakanda is saying they had a seismic activity off the coast of Africa. And this might be alluding to Captain Namor, the Submariner, maybe coming into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But there's something else going on that relates to that that's really interesting. You want to touch on that real quick? Yeah, I did. You know, there's uh, you know, there's been articles, and you know, this has not been covered too much uh, in the news. But you know, if you Google it, you, of course, you can find it there. Or just search for it on the internet. It says a mysterious anomaly under Africa is radically weakening Earth's magnetic field. So we have, I guess, you could say, I don't know if it's art imitating life or life imitating art here. But, uh, above our heads, something's not right. Earth's magnetic field is in a state of dramatic weakening. And, you know, there's those that say, you know, the radiation levels on this Earth are, have increased by up to 18% due to this weakening, weakening of the magnetic field. So, you know, as we see more and more people coming down with cancer, this could be part of the cause of this uh, increased radiation. But it says, and according to mind-boggling new research, uh, this phenomenal disruption is part of a pattern lasting for over 1,000 years. It says right. Earth's magnetic field does not give us our north and south, not, doesn't just give us our north and south pole. It's also what protects us from solar winds and cosmic radiation. But this invisible force is rapidly weakening to the point scientists think it actually could flip with our magnetic poles reversing. And, you know, we've heard this for years from conspiracy theorists. You know, there's going to be a pole shift. But now we see the the Earth's magnetic, you know, the North Pole is moving. We see these things happening on our planet. And according to Isaiah 24, uh, during the tribulation, the Earth is going to uh, reel to and fro like a drunkard. So, you know, we see these things. These are leading. These are pre-tribulation events. And this, this magnetic anomaly is certainly pointing to that. Absolutely. That's uh, very interesting, the, the correlation there. And. Again, we don't know why they put it in the movie, but it's very interesting that this is happening in real life. Now, um, going forward, we see a rat or a mice, whatever it is, crawl across the screen where the van that holds the portal to the quantum realm from the Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. And when this rat crosses the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the UI, it activates the portal and Ant-Man comes out. He's been stuck there for five years. But according to him, it's like five hours. Now, he goes and meets the Avengers and explains himself. But before that, um, right after this hologram meeting, uh, Captain America comes out to talk to Black Widow. They change a few, exchange a few lines. But he's telling her that, look, we got cleaner oceans and this, that, and the other. Uh, I can't remember the exact line, but it's something to deal with environmentalism. She's in her grief. And to make her feel better, he gives her a line about environmentalism. Now, there's people out there that's going to say, what's wrong with clean water? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with taking care of um, our environment? Nothing's wrong with that. But the thought behind it is not what you think. It's a lot of earth worship and taxation and other stuff. So uh, you want to touch on that for a little bit? Yeah, it's almost, you know, they come to the point where, you know, especially with that line in the movie that, you know, we're putting the, the state of our planet you know, ahead of human life, you know, and I'm like, you, we should take care of this planet, but, uh, you know, the, the earth is here to serve us. We're not here to serve it. And that right. seems like what the environmentalists have twisted around that we're here to serve the earth. But, and, you know, the thought was, you know, the all 50% of the population has disappeared on the earth, but, oh, now we have clean air. Oh, there is a, a silver lining to this. And as we see in our, world today and it's especially been promoted to the younger generation now that you know this idea of radical environmentalism you know reducing our carbon footprint you know at all costs i had a 
I pulled up an old article from the New York Times that says teenagers emerge as a force in climate protest across Europe. It says this was dated in January 31st from the New York Times. It says of this year, tens of thousands of children skipped school in Belgium on Thursday to join demonstrations for action against climate change, part of a broader environmental protest movement across Europe that has gathered force over the past several weeks. So we have kids skipping school to, you know, to protest for environmentalism. And, you know, there was another article that I'd read that, you know, talked about steps we can take to reduce our carbon footprint. And one of those was, and as we've mentioned uh, uh, on a previous program about those, when they're talking about going back in time and killing Thanos, one of the ways it's said as a baby, but one of those ways it said that we could, uh, one of the best things we could do to reduce our carbon footprint was to not have any children. And this idea is gaining momentum among young people today. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, to put a couple of things in fo- focus about this, there's something out there called ecosexuals. Okay. And these are, we're talking about people that are talking erotically to plants, erotically. They want access to trees and plants and crazy stuff. So when we say there's more to this, trust me, there's more. There's uh, something out there called Echo Warriors, and this one person that's in this Echo Warrior movement, they basically glued their breasts to the road because they're in rebellion because they think that we're going to be extinct in 12 years. Idiocracy, huh. that's what that is. <laughs> so... Uh, and other, other, other parts of these ecosexuals believe in having literal sex with the earth and that it could save the earth. So you'll see uh, this environmental uh, basic um, indoctrination through a lot of films, uh, TV shows and whatnot. But we just wanted to point that out because that, that was, that's a big part of this whole series anyway. Um, and some of the thinking within the mythos of um, Iron Man. So... Anyway, <laughs> let's move forward a little bit here. And so we have all that. And now, like we said, Thanos is dead. So they don't know what to do. Ant-Man comes out of the portal and, and meets with the Avengers. And they, they, they gather up. They, he talks to them about basically time travel. And then they go talk to Tony Stark about it. He's like, no way. It's not going to work. I don't want nothing to do with it. I have a daughter. I have a wife. I have a good life. After everything I've been through, this is good. And, of course, they disagree with him, but then they, they part ways. And in the, in the middle of all that, we see Iron Man figuring out a, a formula for quantum travel. Okay? And he figures it out rather quickly, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah. But... That's just a little, you know, pet peeve of mine. I, I don't really see it being thought about that quickly. But then again, Iron Man is a copy of Tesla. So there you go. Okay. So now, within the middle of all that, we have the Avengers practicing through the quantum tunnel, time traveling, they're messing it up, and all sorts of weird stuff going on. So then they meet up again with, with Tony Stark after he figures out this, this plan and how to, how to get it accomplished. And from there, they build another time tunnel. And they come up with a plan to go and get the Infinity Stones from certain points in time. Boom, right? And they get they have these space suits that, uh, well, quantum suits. I don't know how they came up with them so fast, but they came up with them <laughs> like they were just sitting around. And they have the, the, what's called the pin particles, which they, these are the particles that turn Ant-Man small. They're using these pin, par- pin particles from Hank Pym to go through these um, time vortexes, okay? Anything you want to add to that? Uh, just that, you know, yeah, like you said, they do come up with these things uh, rather quickly. But, you know, as this is, I guess, an introduction uh, to the public consciousness of quantum physics. And, you know, there's much discussion on quantum computing and quantum physics as, you know, the next realm for artificial intelligence. So we see that this, there is... You know, when we speak of time travel, and there was one scene where they were making fun of all the, the time travel movies, their Back to the Future and things. Uh, there is a realistic push, though, that, you know, some scientists think we can achieve time travel with quantum physics. So uh, this isn't just some, you know, I guess uh, some pie in the sky dream. There are physicists working on this. And with the quantum computing uh, 
you know, actually some think this is opening doors to other dimensions. Right. And that all leads back to the subject of CERN. In fact, um, the tunnel that they go through, the machine that they built, as far as the portal, where they, what they're standing on, when they activate it, it looks like CERN. Yep. And that's also... Like, uh, and that just goes back to, you know, the Into the Spider-Verse film. You know, that there, that one machine they had, just it looked exactly like CERN as well. Exactly. And uh, we, we can't cover everything about CERN in this, in, in this review. Uh, all we're going to say is if you do your research, you see a lot of things dealing with quantum physics, opening portals, talking to spirits, and all sorts of stuff. So you might want to go do your research about that. Uh, it's because it's a real phenomenon that they want to happen. They're looking for dark matter, the God particle, and that's, like I said before, communication with spirits. And also one little thing, uh, I said this before in another show that I might be stressing this a little bit, but when they, before they, they activate the time machine, they put their fists together in a circle, and, and below them, it seems like a construct of the black sun, which which is, goes back into Saturn and the Nazis and all this esoteric knowledge. Yeah, I did notice that. Yeah. yeah. So just another little nugget for you all that, that are listening. Before they go back in time now, they meet up with the Hulk. Now the Hulk is not what you think. He's now Professor Hulk. Basically, Bruce Banner has found a way to merge his self with the foul spirit in him called the Hulk. If you don't know what a foul spirit is, that's more like a demon, fallen angel, something like that. And he unites both of their consciousness. And so now he's, he's the brains and the brawn at the same time. And so now, you want to say anything about that before I go on or? Uh, well, you know, they just, they've had several incarnations of that, you know, during the comics. You know, there were, there were always storylines where, you know, Bruce Banner would have control of the Hulk's body. So uh, that was not surprising that they, they finally brought that one out in the film. Right. And, and many different incarnations. We have the Grey Hulk, and Green Hulk, both of them together and all sorts of stuff going on there. Plus, they even have a, a Red Hulk, which is not Bruce Banner, but somebody else. General Ross. Yeah, yeah. the Red Hulk. Okay, so that's that's just another. Yeah, really, and that, but you know that goes back to the almost the MK Ultra and the the uh, the personalities of uh, the Gray Hulk and the all the different incarnations of the Hulk go back. You know, in the storyline, you know Bruce was abused as a child, and they came out with all these different personalities. So you can see the even the MK Ultra tie in there. Right, exactly. And now, so when they're going, they're going back in the time now. They, they, some of them, the Hulk, Captain America, Iron Man, and Ant-Man, and he meets with the, the Ancient One. And the Ancient One basically knocks the spirit of Bruce Banner out of the Hulk's body. And they have a con- conversation about if you take the stones, then there's other timelines will be made and all this other stuff, blah, blah, blah. And he convinces her that they really need it and that Doctor Strange gave away the time stone in the future for a reason. That happens, and there's a scene now within uh, this this time space where Ant-Man and Iron Man go to get the mind stone from Loki, or the people that are carrying Loki's case. I won't give you the whole story, I'll just say this, that before, before we get to that part, there's some gay innuendo <laughs> where they start off looking at Captain America's butt, right? And they call, they call it America's ASS, okay? And Ant-Man says to, uh, he's the one that started the joke. And uh, Iron Man agrees with him, Tony Stark. And then they're ready to start con- going on their mission now. And we see that Ant-Man says to Iron Man, flick me after turning his butt towards Iron Man. <laughs> then later on, we see Ant-Man is supposed to go into the past version of Tony Stark to give him a, like a, a slight heart attack to so they can get him to lose the, um, the Tesseract he has in a case, right? And so he, he's it's in uh, Iron Man's suit. He's dressed, he's just dressed up as, as he's normal. And um, he says to, to the future Iron Man that's behind him in, 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 a, in the disguise as a policeman, he said, is that axe you're wearing? And he's like, you know, who says this, right? So, okay, whatever. You can take that how you want to. Seems a little gay to me. But um, he goes further 
and he's supposed to go into the mission. He's stalling, and, and then Iron Man says, "Go, go ahead and do it." And he says, "I'm going to go inside you now." Yep. Get, get in your window to me. <laughs> well, you know, you know surprisingly, uh, surprisingly enough, Chris, you know, Marvel has been criticized by those, you know, uh, promoting the homosexual agenda that they've not been gay enough, and you know, most of the things they have have been, you know, so far innuendo. But you know, they have even deleted some scenes from previous movies. Uh, there's supposedly a scene in Ragnarok that was cut with Valkyrie, but so they're they're actually being pushed, you know, to promote more gay characters. And from what I'm hearing, in in Phase Four with the Eternals, there's going to be an openly gay character. Yeah, absolutely. And there was supposed to be a gay character in um, Black Panther too, um, and they cut that scene out. Uh, it was it was a woman lesbian, one of the the guards. So in this movie. We have the first openly gay character sitting in a sort of like an AAA meeting for people dealing with the event, the rapture. And it's the director, one of the brothers of the film, I think Joe Rooster. And he's talking about, as, as the character, he's saying basically they, they had dinners and, and crying and, and all stuff after it happened. And basically how him and his lover coped with it. And of course, you know, Captain America had to placate to the, to the whole idea. <laughs> and so here we go with the first openly gay scene in the Marvel cin- Cinematic Universe. Yep. And like I said, they have been, you know, they have been criticized by those on the, on the, on the side of, of the, uh, the gay agenda. But apparently, as I said, when the Eternals come out, and I think we're going to see a huge shift in Phase 4. With the Eternals, you know, the the whole Eternals, you know, uh, storyline is about, you know, uh, aliens seeding the planet. So you're going to have that there and then with a gay character now. So I think we're going to see a, a radical turn now in, in Phase 4. Right. We're, we're going to see a lot of feminism and sodomite activity. But um, as we move forward now, Iron Man and Ant-Man fumble the job with a Tesseract Loki basically grabs it after Iron Man has a heart attack and, and Hulk um, busts out of the, the, the past Hulk. It was coming down the stairs and he busts out of a door, knocked Iron Man, knocked him across the room with the Tesseract flying. And, and while everybody's paying attention to past Tony Stark, Loki of the past grabbed the Tesseract and disappears in a portal. Yeah. No, no, and, no. But I think that was written, you know, to bring Loki back into the universe after he'd been killed. So... Right. So, so it, basically, they're kind of rewriting history here. So after that, we have Tony Stark and Captain America meet up. They talk about the failures that they just had. And uh, basically, Captain America had to battle himself to get the, the, the Loki's staff. And they, he, he, he accomplished his mission. And uh, by the way, before he accomplished his mission, when he battled himself, he, he basically knocks out his former self with the Loki staff, and for some reason he decides to look down at his own butt again and says, yes, that's America's ASS. Yeah, uh, yeah, whatever, right? <laughs> so they're all group- regrouping now, and Captain America and Iron Man decide to go back to the 70s where he knows that the, the Tesseract is on this military base. Boom, that happens. In the meantime, we have... Black Widow and Hawkeye go into the planet where they get the Soul Stone from. War Machine and Nebula goes to the planet to get the Space Stone, where, which, which was seen in the first Guardians of the Galaxy, Galaxy movie. And so from here, what we see is really fast. We see uh, Nebula basically has this, because she's in the same space with herself and it's kind of tied to the technology, we see that on Thanos' ship, some sort of um, glitch in her in her circuitry happens, and then they see a hologram and try to figure out. No, they hear they hear they see a hologram with a voice attached to it and everything, and they try to figure out what's going on here. Da 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 da, and she's kind of she's knocked out where she was previously. Well, Chris, uh, right there, let me interject. Uh, that I believe they're bringing in the Internet of Things there, as you can see is. When she goes back in and, and gets in, in the, you know, uh, range of his ship, he's able to read, you know, her circuitry then and her, uh, 
I guess anything there on whatever, uh, I don't know what kind of memory, uh, you know, as far as building some kind of hard drive into her system, but he's able to read it then. So to me, that's just speaking of the internet of things there interjecting. Uh, that is a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. And think about that. Uh, and, and, and they, they are already accomplished getting the space stone. So war machine left before nebula could, right? And, right. And so now, back on Vormir, where the Space Stone is, Black uh, Widow and Hawkeye go to meet Red Skull, and he shows them that they, he knows all about them, I guess through the Soul Stone. It's alive again, as I said. And so now these two are battling, what are we going to do? Is he really telling the truth? Does there have to be a sacrifice? And Black Widow says, look, Thanos didn't come back with his daughter. He came here, didn't come back with his daughter. Uh, so one of us has to die. So they go a little, through a little uh, scuffling for one of them to sacrifice themselves. And as always, we have two, we have two towers there, as in the first film. Right. And there has to be blood. And this blood has to come out of love, which is sometimes in the in spiritism is the fifth element or the sixth element, depending on where you're looking. And um, so just like the movie, the fifth element with Bruce Willis and this uh, hybrid godlike woman, they, 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 they put the four elements down. And before the, the planetoid hits earth, they come together in, in unity as love and destroys this planetoid. So it's the same concept. If you didn't see the fifth element, then you might not have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> but so uh, Black Widow ends up dying. That's the matter of that story. And Hawkeye gets the soul stone. And so now Nebula is caught by Thanos and her sister and her past self at the same time. And they go through all this, this jargon, da 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 And basically they want to kill her, but don't want to kill her, so they use the former version of Nebula to come back with the Pym particles. The one, she gave one to Thanos and kept one for herself. And she she comes back because everybody has to come back at the same time. So no matter where, where you are in time, once you use the Pym particle to come back to our time, you're going to come back all at the same time. Now, right. <laughs> they all come back at the same time. This is close to the end of the movie now. And when they notice that Black Widow's dead, and she shouldn't come back, and of course Hawkeye informs them, and basically now they're out there mourning for Black Widow, and they really want to get this over with. So they have all the stones. Oh, we left out a, a very important part. <laughs> Thor. Yeah. Him and Rocket Raccoon. Basically now, well, okay, so... The Hulk and Rocket Raccoon go to see Thor in what's called New Asgard. This is a part of the comic book lore, too. And New Asgard is basically a floating city above some countryside. But it's different here. It's the it's actual countryside with real buildings and everything. It's not floating above the, the, the country. So anyway, <coughs> they go and meet with Thor and Valkyrie. And uh, Valkyrie tells him, basically, he doesn't want to meet with anyone. They, they can't figure out why. Basically, Thor is, is in depression, and he's reluctant to do anything. He's a alcoholic. He's, now he's fat, fat Thor. And he's basically a, a copy of the Big Lebowski. If you ever saw that movie, I didn't, but I know exactly what I've seen the images. So he's, uh, like I said, reluctant to, to do anything because he's so depressed. But anyway, they get him to do it anyway. And... He's the running gag of the movie about him being drunk and not really in his right mindset. He's not a hero anymore. Da, 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 da. So anyway, he goes back in time with Rocket Raccoon to get the ether, which is the reality stone, right? It's not right. necessarily a stone, but we'll just keep it like that. So anyway, um, he goes there and he's still reluctant. Rocket Raccoon is basically the hero on this side, but he wants to meet up with his mother and he meets up with his mother, and she kind of recognizes him, but not. And then da 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 da. But then she said, she has the most wisdom because she was raised by witches, right? And many, many of you might not take that to be anything, you know, 
to be shocked at. But remember now, witchcraft is witchcraft is the fastest growing religion in America. Exactly. Whether whether it be Wiccan or some other offshoot of witchcraft, it's the fastest growing religion. So this gives uh, people that are interested in this stuff like, wow, that's a lot of wisdom, man. She was raised by a witch and blah 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 blah. You know. So anyway, that's just a little, little nugget. So uh, Rocket gets the ether from uh, Thor's ex girlfriend, and he he gets back. His, his hammer was destroyed in Thor Ragnarok, and he basically calls his hammer to him. So it's a, a bunch of rewriting of history again. And he comes back with Rocket with the ether and the hammer. So everyone is now back. They're mourning over Black Widow, and they basically want to get it done now. So they, they configure a gauntlet through Iron Man's technology to fit the stones in. And this is key to the end of the movie. Now, Thor wants to use the gauntlet because he thinks because lightning is coursing through his vein and he is the false god, Baal, um, (laughs) that he can handle it, right? Now, Hulk says, no, it's full of gamma radiation. I'm the one to do it. And they say, are you sure you're going to survive? He doesn't know. He puts the glove on. And then... He does the snap. And in the middle of this, just to save time here with, with this discussion, he tries to bring Black Widow back, but we don't find it out till later. So anyway, he does the snap, and we don't know exactly what happens when he does it, because it's not immediate. We, at least it doesn't seem so. But um, in the middle of all this, I'm trying to keep this in a certain distinct way, um, Nebula, the false one that came back, opens up the time portal, and then... Thanos had used the pin particles, I don't know how, but he used it to shrink his massive ship with armies to come out of that time. It's it's a tiny little ship that as it comes out of the time portal, it becomes bigger and bigger and just busts through the whole building. And no one seems to notice this, (laughs) even though it's massive. (laughs) It's a massive break. And you could feel it if you if you if you think about it. Right. Um, And so everyone distracted by the by the snap and everything. But in the meantime, Ant-Man is looking out a window to some trees and he sees some birds and he's like, it worked. But in the meantime, as he's looking and saying this, uh, uh, Hawkeye's getting a call from his wife and who was snapped out, as we said before. And uh, 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 on top above the Avengers headquarters, Thanos is raining down hell in the, in the form of missiles on the whole compound, which just obliterates it. And people are falling, the Avengers are falling through this and that, and uh, all sorts of damage are done. And basically, Nebula goes out to Thanos and say, you know, what do you want me to do? And he say, he said, basically, go get the stones, and and um, I'll just sit here and wait while you go do what I need you to do. Anything before I go on? No, Chris, I'm impressed. I think you got the movie memorized after you've seen it 20 times. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, um so we're going to get into more of some of the, the esoteric stuff, but there's not too much to really um, explore because we covered so much from the first movie. So we're going to just try to um, go by the numbers a little bit here now. So basically, Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor come out to meet Thanos, and they want to make sure they're all on the same page. We need to kill this guy, right? And Thor grabs his hammer and Stormbreaker, the axe, and they all run out to face Thanos, and Thanos is, as his usual, arrogant self. This made me kind of laugh. He's like, you guys, you can't deal with your failure, so that leads you back to me. (laughs) I laughed in the theater so hard, man. But um, basically now, remember, this is an allegory now for God. Yep. So now what we're seeing here is Thanos about to bring on Armageddon or the wrath of God on this planet, because he not only has a ship above, he has armies with him, and not just armies, the same type of things you saw in Black Panther, if you saw that movie, Uh, these animal creatures and his old flying worm-looking things. But before that, he starts fighting Thor and Iron Man and all, all at the same time, none of them could beat him, and he almost gets to kill Thor. Um, with his own axe. But before that, um, Captain America, I, I'm supposing because he mended everything with Tony Stark, is now able to wield the hammer of Thor. 
he's not worthy. So he, he grabs the hammer and starts throwing lightning and all this stuff. And for people that don't think that he's able to do that, that's in a comic book as well. So um, he's able to use the force. I'm gonna, I'll get back to the force in a second. And, and so anyway, they almost beat him, but not quite. He really makes, he mops the floor with them, all three of them. And so after this now... Uh, let me interject one thing before you get away from this point. Um, when you mention the allegorical concept of, of God here, we do see that this being portrayed, but we also notice that uh, they're able to undo this God's, I guess you could say, will with a, with a snapshot by their techno technological means, by them being able to go and use the quantum physics and the quantum time travel they're able to undo what the God did. So I wanted to interject that right there that, you know, they're, uh, they're using science and technology to battle this God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, as they take a pause, a little breath, they, they're at their, 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 their end. They don't know what to do. This guy's too powerful. Uh, he can even beat up the God of Thunder, AKA Baal, um, or Baal. And they hear something. Captain America hears a, a Falcon through his um his comms piece, and basically portals start opening up, tons of them, and we see everyone that was taken by the snap, they come back, and it's a huge army from different realms, planets, and Earth too as well, like Wakanda. Um, we even see the Wasp show up, and uh, everyone that was taken, including Spider Man. So. They're about to start, and this is where we see what the line that was we've been waiting for for decade, well, for a decade. Um, Avengers assemble, right? Right. They all rush, and at this point is where Thanos calls his army down, and we see all these animal-looking things and some of the people that got killed off in the in the last one. Because remember, all of these things are from the past, so they're back, uh, in, 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 including his enforcers. Proxima Midnight and the other people that, that run with her. Yeah. So anyway, this big battle is going on. They're trying to get the gauntlet to Portal of Ant-Man in a truck that was parked outside. I'm skipping a lot of detail here. So um, they're doing all this. Spider-Man is trying to get the, the gauntlet there. Um, Hawkeye, Black Panther, and they're all getting just, you know, they, they're succeeding enough to succeeding at the same time. Thanos is and his minions are basically giving them a hard time. And so Scarlet Witch appears out of nowhere and says, says to Thanos, Thanos that you took everything away from me. He's like, I don't even know you. <laughs> but anyway, she goes at him anyway, says, you, you will, and starts using this, this, this elemental magic to, uh, and she almost kills him. So in the meantime here, he starts raining down rockets at anyone, even his own forces. And it, it's almost working until... The, the, the guns or the missile launchers from this ship starts looking up into the sky. And this is very significant because everyone's wondering, what are they, what are they aiming at? What are they shooting at? And out from the sky comes Captain Marvel. And she basically, basically obliterates this space cruiser with one swiping, uh, just bust right through it, her whole body. And remember now, why significant? Because Captain Marvel, as we explained in, in two reviews, that she is the queen of heaven. She is Isis. She is Ishtar. She is Diana. She is all of these uh, earth worship uh, deities from different cultures. And so that's why it's so significant that she comes from the heavens. I want you to pay attention to that, right? And so in the middle of all this now, remember that they're trying to get the gauntlet to the... To the uh, to the uh, portal. And so she grabs the gauntlet from Spider-Man and it, here's this forced female empowerment narrative where all of a sudden all these females come together to beat up everybody. And it seems like they're getting some success, but it's just a, a plot device for the movie that was just kind of shoehorned in. And um, so there's your feminist aspect, but this, this whole collaboration here is dealing with um, a comic book called A-Force, which is, which is an all-female comic book um, series. And I, I don't really have a problem with that. The problem is that it's confirmed to be a feminist comic book. That's the problem I have with it. 
So, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't have to say it. That's the, that's the real premise of this comic book. So anyway, we might see an iteration of that in the future. I'm not sure. Now, we get to the part where before they get the gauntlet to the, the truck, Thanos basically throws his blade at it and, it and it explodes and knocks Captain Marvel back and the, the gauntlet is all out in the open. Thanos goes for it. Captain, uh, Iron Man tries to stop him and then he, he basically knocks Iron Man away, puts on the glove, ready to do a snap and then here comes Captain Marvel with all her strength battling Thanos. He can't seem to get this fly off of his arm so he takes out one of the stone, the, the actual the power stone and blows Captain Marvel to the back, kind of knocks her out, and then puts the stone back in, ready to do a snap, and um, Iron Man basically grabs him before he could do it, but he didn't really know, really know what was going on, and then, major spoiler, major, major spoiler, Iron Man, through his own tech, because the tech on, on the glove was his tech anyway, he, he, he makes the, basically the stones crawl onto his other glove, and he... Um, sacrifices himself and declares himself as Iron Man, snaps it, does the snap to obliterate Thanos' army and him. But the, the real significance of this, if you didn't realize, in the first poster for Infinity War, Iron Man was laid out in a cross position. So he was supposed to sacrifice himself for the entire world. So here we have a Jesus Christ type figure and he gives his life for humanity. And there's some of the end of the movie. So I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> and yeah, now, I've got to go look at that poster now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, that, wouldn't and all, for, that wouldn't be a first for Marvel. You know, Marvel was known for going uh, derogatory things like that with people right. on, uh, in, on the end of their comics. So. Yeah. So um, here we have uh, the sacrificial element. Uh, Thanos is basically dusted with his army and all that stuff. Now we can get to some of the other esoteric portions of this this um, this movie. We have a big, gigantic emphasis on humanism. Because remember now, Avengers don't know what to do. Humanity doesn't know what to do. This is this is equivalent to well, sort of equivalent to the Seven Year Tribulation, right? Because here we have. The elites, this, the, from the, the storyline in, in the beginning, it was an elitist depopulation storyline. And even one article, I can't remember from where, says that you might as well call it like um, environmentalist Avengers or something like that, it said, right? Um, yeah, war, yeah. They, I think that was an MSN or, or it was either a Forbes, I think it was a Forbes article. Yeah. Called it uh, environmental war. <laughs> yeah, something like that, right? And... The, the focus on humanism is very important to realize that this is this is a, a, a very evident plot point in a lot of movies because ma humanity is always trying to stop the apocalypse in these movies. The apocalypse basically is the revelation of Jesus Christ, him as the same God from the Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and with his wrath to punish humanity for his sin and to basically show Israel their right place in, 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 in the future by believing in him. When I say the future, I also mean eternity. This is basically the apocalypse. The apocalypse is not necessarily uh, just disaster, okay? And remember, even in Pacific Rim, the, the greatest line in that movie, according to the producer, was, we are canceling the apocalypse. So here we are, the humans, the non-humans, the former humans <laughs> are taking their own will, their own way to turn back what, what seems like the seven year tribulation. And I'm not stretching that too much. If you know, <laughs> you know, there's, there's so many storylines and movies, you know, uh, there was a movie several years ago called rapture Palooza. And it was sort of a, a campy movie, but, you know, the, the, at the end, you know, they were trying to shoot Jesus Christ out of the air as he was coming back on a white horse with a, with a laser gun. And, you know, but, you know, that stuff seems like, oh, that's, you know, sort of far-fetched science fiction. But I believe part of the artificial intelligence, a part, I believe a part of all the quantum computing, 
I believe that all the technological advancements uh, that are being made in our time, I believe Satan and the Antichrist will, will use these things to actually battle Christ when he comes back. Absolutely. And and the Bible is clear in Revelation. Uh, yeah, they're going to bring the armies of the earth, all the armies of the earth will gather together there at the, right. over and there I at think, the uh, ghetto. Yeah, I think it specifically says that they will turn their weapons on him. Something like that. Anyway. See, there, you get into some, there's a couple of portions of the scripture there that um, I get confused. Let me let me go over there and read those. Uh, there's one in Joel, I believe specifically one you're referring to, uh, where God almost dares men to come and battle him. He says over here in Joel 3, verse number 10, he says, or actually verse number 9, he says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Then he says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. You know, and there, what I, I kind of chuckle about this because there's a little song, you know, that, that quotes this verse, but uh, they're taking it totally out of context in that song. This song is, as I, I may mention, it's God daring man to come and battle him. He says in verse number 11, assemble yourselves. And come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause the mighty ones to come down. O Lord, let the heathen be wakened, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I set to judge all the heathen round about. And then verse 13 and 14, here's the tie in Revelation. He says, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. That's quoted in Revelation chapter 14. Get ye down, for the press is full, the fat overflow. For their wickedness is great, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Exactly, and to, for people that that are worried, uh, thinking about Armageddon, it, it would be, it won't be that long. It won't be like this long, drawn out war. Jesus no. Christ is going to crush them with the words from His mouth. Right. Okay, so, but as as far as um, you know, this is again, this is a humanistic movie. And how can man fix the rapture? How can we re re reverse this? This whole movie is about reversing the rapture. And if you think that I'm, a, I'm stretching this a little too far, I'm going to read you some quotes from New Age writers that channel spirits. These are direct quotes, right? And this one is from, and I, we, I also did this in the review for Infinity War to show you that these aliens and uh, the, 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 the idea of a UFO and the idea of a rapture, they, they're mixed together, right? And it, this is Barbara Mas Machiniak. She's a famous New Age author and challenger. In her book, Bringers of the Dawn, she documents that she claims extraterrestrials from the star system of the Pleiades have told her, quote, there will be a great shifting within humanity on this planet. It will seem that great chaos and turmoil are forming that nations are rising against each other in war and that earthquakes are happening more frequently. This is a quote from, well, not a quote, not a direct quote, but this is the thought in Matthew 24. And it says, earth is shaking itself free and a certain realignment or adjustment period is to be expected. The people who leave the planet during the time of earth changes do not fit here any longer. And they are stopping the harmony of Earth. When the time comes that perhaps 20 million people leave the planet at one time, there will be a tremendous shift in consciousness for those who are remaining. And if for those for those that you don't that don't know, there was a movie out called The Remaining, right? Yeah. And then we have um, the channeler Thelma Ter Terrell, um, who says. Uh, well, basically, basically uh, who goes by the, the spiritual name Tuella, wrote a book called Project World Evacuation. These are some quotes from her book. Quote, our rescue ship will be able to come in close enough in the twinkling of an eye to set the lifting beams in op op operation in a moment and all over the globe where events warrant it. This will be the method of evacuation. Mankind will be lifted, levitated, shall we say, by the beams from our smaller ships. These smaller crafts will, in turn, taxi the persons to the larger ships overhead. 
higher in the atmosphere where there is ample space and quarters and supplies for millions of people, the great evacuation will come upon the world very suddenly. The flash of emergency events will be as a lightning that flashes in the sky. Sort of like the return of Christ, right? Right. <laughs> um, so we, we see, remember now, in the twinkling of an eye, of an eye is mentioned in um, Thessalonians. And uh, these are terms taken out of the Bible. And, you know, as, as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so it will be in the coming of the Son of, Son of Man. So they know what they're doing. At least these creatures that they're, uh, these foul spirits that contacting know what to tell them. And they're using biblical terms. Now, here's a couple more. Uh, these are This is from various channelers. And they say, quote, the cataclysms are all part of purifying this earth back to a millennium. What is going to happen when you reach a certain point is that you will have the first wave of ascension. Those bodies that cannot take this change will go in the first wave of ascension. They will be taken up and their bodies will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye, they will be removed from the physical completely into the new spiritual body. This is what this is what the, 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 the quote in Te Thessalonians tells us. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then now it says, there will be many visits from the galaxies by interdimensional beings, as from the Pleiades, to assist and in some cases to rescue people and take them into higher places. Those are the flying machines that you are seeing coming into your galaxies that have been preparing themselves for up to the last 40 years. Uh, at the time that this was written, um, 1992. And then it says, um, some never die on this earth. These missing persons have already been taken as their time was not up and they were not meant to go through a demise. They went through a liftoff in UFOs, end quote. And remember, there's a line in Endgame, something like um, people aren't ever really gone. Yeah. Remember and that? Yeah, that's toward the end, and you know that's when they're talking. I believe it is Hawkeye and the Scarlet Witch are discussing, you know, referring to the Black Widow and the Vision mm -hmm. and being dead. And you know that goes on once again. There you go with artificial intelligence, you know, almost given though given that a human like quality when she's talking about the Vision. Right, and what they what they're doing in the real world is they're basically dehumanizing humanity and humanizing technology. Right. And so what, there's a thing out there called the Hegelian dialect, and this could be used in news and, and other forms of communication, where you have the thesis, the antithesis, and then the synthesis. So we have robots, robot technology, we have humanity, we discuss these two points, and then in the middle, we'll have a hybrid. Right. Just like conservatism, commun uh, fascism, and in the middle, you'll have socialism. Right. <laughs> so j just another thought for everyone listening. And if you're not tired of me rambling on about this stuff uh, yet. <laughs> hey, Chris, I wanted to, you know, go back to what you were saying there, uh, the reading the New Age writings. To me, it's funny how people who don't want to quote the Bible when it's to further their agenda and, you know, as they were quoting uh, on the twinkling of an eye. And that took my mind over to the book of Isaiah. And as I mentioned, there was two scriptures that often get confused in the Bible. Uh, as the one I read you there, where Isaiah 2 said this, and this is on the, what they call the Isaiah wall at the United Nations. And this is the quote, it says in verse number four, and he shall judge among the nations. And this is talking about, the, this is made in reference to the millennial reign Thousand year reign of Christ, he shall judge among the nations, and he shall and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And you know that's the idea that the United Nations say they can project. Once again, tying in with what you mentioned in humanism, that they can they can do away with the wars, uh, when in reality. The verse they should have on the United Nations is one I read earlier over in Joel 3, where they are the ones that are going to assemble and make war 
and go against God there at the Battle of Armageddon. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing what people take out of the Bible to make these stories. And we get entertained by it. Uh, again, we're not trying to tell you what to watch, where to watch it, or when to watch it. But we get entertained by the most blasphemous things, you know? Um, and, and there's more to talk about here because we mentioned this earlier about the killing of baby Thanos. War Machine basically bought this idea up while they were talking about time travel. Why don't we just go back and kill baby Thanos? You know, just strangle him. Uh, that's not the word he used, but he used the gesture for that. And the Hulk was like, no, that's even a worse thought, you know? But this idea of abortion, the murdering of innocent babies, it's just shoehorned in there. Like, this, it wasn't funny to me, <laughs> you know? It's, 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 brain, it, it, it's brainwashing, all this is. And, and, you know, that's, I believe that's why we do this, you know, that, you say, you know, people are, you know, people can be entertained by this blasphemous things, but a lot of times people don't even know that it is blasphemous. You know, they mm-hmm. might, they made this thing. These, a lot of these innuendos, a lot of these references are so subtle, you know, that sometimes people don't really catch on. It's, it's a, a massive form of brainwashing. I've been studying this a little bit recently. The reason I want to mention this, you have that part about, you know, but, you know, maybe if we kill this baby, it will make things better. Right. And, you know, like, they carried that idea. And because I, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, I was thinking, I've, I've raised chickens and, and poultry here at, at my house. And, you know, I was seeing some chickens walk around in the yard. And I was like, you know, I was thinking, you know, that's, that's the way maybe the dinosaurs walk. Then I caught myself. I thought, no, that's the way the dinosaurs are portrayed on the movie to right. walk chickens to make us believe in evolution that they evolved from birds. Right. Whereas reality, nobody knows how a dinosaur walks. You know, right. I, so I can even catch myself, you know, thinking these little thoughts that, that have been put in there by media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of us are under this massive uh, mind control from different aspects of life. But the media at this time right now is one of the biggest ways to get brainwashed, you know, right. other than the ed- educational system. <laughs> so yeah, Hitler, Hitler would be proud of our media today. I mean, he, he would he would jump at the chance to have control of such of such media as we have today. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, I just want to just slide into some of the characteristics of a lot of these characters in these movies. As I mentioned before, the Force, also known as the the Tao, the Chi, uh, elemental magic, witchcraft, also the yin and the yang, the right hand path, the left hand path, the universe, the the Brahma. And I can go on and on and on with different names. All of this force, this uh, same thing seen in um, Jean Grey of Dark Phoenix. So it's about this force, this this thing that so in some places has, has created the universe. In other places, like Transformers, it's this cube. Um, and it's already this force. It's the same thing in martial arts. Um, and we see the Queen of Heaven, Isis, Ishtar, Inanna, a.k.a. Miss Marvel or Captain Marvel, used the same force because her powers came from the Tesseract, which is one of the first elemental stones in the comic books that was formed in the beginning of the universe, right? And yep. again, it's alive. <laughs> um, and then we have Baal, or Baal, the god of thunder, the storm god, in the iteration of Thor, right? Like I said before. And his father, Odin's son, and all this stuff, right? Then, and he wields the hammer and calls on fire from heaven, a.k.a. lightning, right? Uh, yep. Then you have genetically modified humans, like Spider-Man. Um, we have man merging with machine, like Tony Starks, who has these now particles in him that he doesn't need to put on a suit anymore. It comes out of his body. And, and this is not a, a concept that's far from reality right now. This, right. is, this is stuff being made right now as we talk, right? And in fact, Obama, before he left office, way before he left office, I think this was in 2015 or 14, um, where he put in a, a, a call to make Iron Man suits. You can go look it up. It's in the news. It's public knowledge. There's nothing 
<laughs> from some weird conspiracy site. Uh, then also we have the masters of the mystical arts, Doctor Strange, the Ancient One, and more, um, who are using again this force to create portals, open uh, and uh, stop the floods from happening, and all this stuff in the movie. And then we go and we have shamans, which are the same type of people that take drugs to enter other realms of the dead and uh, use this mystical stuff in their tech, right? Black Panther, his warriors, and other people that worship animals in that country, uh, they use this elemental force, this drug usage, which helps them to contact spirits or the goddess Bast itself in Black Panther to or the Black Panther line to basically rule over them with tech, right? And then we have... Well, that's, you know, a growing, that's a growing thing today, you know, the use of drugs to get into that altered state of consciousness. Right, this goes back to ayahuasca, DMT, and yep. other forms of, of drugs, even down to marijuana sometimes, uh, depending on how you, you're using it. So this can't be refuted. I'm just telling you, I'm giving you the raw version instead of giving you pretty names, right? And as a super soldier, Captain America is a super soldier. And, you know, of course, we see that uh, in the in the news today as well as they're trying to merge. You know, they're building these exoskeleton suits to merge with soldiers and, you know, uh, working with different genes to maybe give soldiers, uh, you know, heightened senses. So this, this, these things are that are happening. Are these things are reality? Right. And it's not just happening in America. This is a one part of the arms race around the globe uh artificial intelligence super soldiers uh, and anything dealing with tech okay <laughs> drones <laughs> or, or, and all that stuff right so what we see here is humanity using demonic power the dep demonic power of lucifer to stop the apocalypse yep that's that's it in a, in a nutshell and to go back to a point that you mentioned earlier we saw the memorial for the people that disappeared. And it's sort of reminiscent of the Georgia, Georgia Guidestones. And if you don't know about the Georgia Guidestones, it's talking about we they have to call the population down to 500 million. So it's the same concept. And I would do, if, you, if you're not familiar with the concept of the Georgia, Georgia Guidestones, you want to do some research on that. So I, I think my final point here, if we didn't cover everything, I'm pretty sure we did. <laughs> Um, is the, the environmental movement, it's a big thing in all these movies, uh, especially the sci-fi ones and the superhero ones, big, big, big overarching element. And a lot, another part of this element is uh, evolution, as we said before. I think we said before. Yes. Uh, evolution is a huge part of this, and a lot of this can't exist without evolution, without the concept of evolution. And... Uh, I'm, I'm stark on, I don't believe in evolution. I think it's a big farce. And I believe the, the biblical account of creation. Now, there's something that happened in the first movie. And Thanos, I don't know where it took him, if it was into the space stone or just in the spiritual realm. But his daughter, Gamora, who he sacrificed, um, turned and talked to him. And I think I, I heard one time that when he, when he was uh, supposed to come up in this realm, that he was supposed to come out of blood, but it was too much for the, the younger audiences. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and she yeah, and she's standing onto a shin under a Shinto like temple, which if you don't for the people that listen, if you don't know what Shintoism is, basically it comes out of Japan and it's it's an offspring from some of the Hindu Hindu stuff, just like Buddhism, and they believe that they are descendants of the gods, right? So they think they're set apart from humanity. They're special. And so this is where we get a lot of stuff on manga and anime and whatever. So just explain that a little bit. But she's under the Shinto like temple, and she turns to him and she says, "What did, did you basically did you do accomplish what you set out to do?" And he was like, "Yeah." And she said, "What did it cost you?" And he said, "Everything." Yeah. Right. And my parallel to that is when Jesus came down from glory to come to humanity to lay his life down for us. It cost him everything earthly to die for us for our sins and to give us eternal life it cost him everything earthly not his deity just he had to spill his own blood he was the only 
perfect sacrifice. He fulfilled the whole law. He was perfect in all. He did not sin. And he sacrificed his life to you and me, everyone in the world, not just special people picked out over time. It's everyone in the world he died for. And we all have a choice to turn to him today based on the gospel, which says that we are all born in sin and we have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are accountable to death. And you are basically made to live forever in this sense. You will spend eternity somewhere, either with Jesus Christ and eternity or in the lake of fire after the, the great white throne judgment. This movie and other movies, they don't show you that. And I don't think they ever will, <laughs> based on the way things are going, right? We need Jesus Christ. And we see other people sacrificed in these movies to be a replacement for Jesus Christ. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from this whole discussion, if not the biggest, that no matter how much you're entertained, how much you disagree with us, there's a reckoning coming, and it's coming soon. It doesn't matter if it's in a great tribulation. It doesn't matter if it's 30 seconds from now. All of us have to face death and have to face the creator of this universe. It was made for him and by him. It's accounted in the, the Gospel of John. So if you're not a believer, you might want to look that up. Anything else you want to add? I mean, yeah, yeah I think you hit the nail right on the head there. But, you know, you know, we, we're told over there in the book of James that, you know, he, he asks us about what is our life. He says, even with a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, I, I look back at my life even today and, you know, I'm, I'm approaching my fifth decade. But, you know, I look back and it just seems like it's been no time. I can, you know, I was just thinking, reminiscing back as, you know, we passed the anniversary of D-Day. And I was thinking about I had a uh, an uncle that was in the D-Day invasion there on Normandy and Think about how I used to go out and spend the time with him, and he'd tell me about the invasion. You know, just when I was when I was just, uh, you know a, a child, and you know, how much he scared me talking about all the, all they went through. You know, he was a great great hero. But as I just think about, you know, that seemed like it's been no time. But you know, that that time has just passed. Like it's, you know, I guess you could say the snap of your fingers. What this time is passing by, like, and then we're not promised tomorrow. You know, we're talking about the things that are happening with tech, you know, that, you know, with the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, the, the noose is tightening on people. As we were talking before the show that, you know, how these algorithms are running and how they're tracking us, every, they, every move we're making now, they're tracking us and uh, building profiles on us. Now, all, the, all the tech and all the uh, is, is coming together, uh, you know, to form a web about us, you know. We see all the natural disasters that's happening. You know, we have our weather that's, you know, chaotic. We have everything seems out of balance. All these things are, you know, are coming together now. You know, there's a, there's a great, I guess you could say, culmination of things that are coming together. That Things to let everyone know, you know, that we're not going to be on this earth too much longer. And, I, you know, even, and that's part driven home, too, in this film, that, you know, humanity is panicking now. They see these things coming. But, you know, they really don't have any answers, you know, other than, you know, try man at his best state, as we're told in the book of Ecclesiastes, is altogether vanity. But they're going to try and stem off the apocalypse in the natural realm. But the only answer, the only way of escape for us today is through Jesus Christ. And his death, his, well, his perfect life, as you mentioned, he lived a perfect life on this earth for 33 years. His vicarious death on the cross as a substitutionary atonement for our sins, you know, I, he took, he became sin for us. That's what we're told over there in one place. He actually became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's where our righteousness is. It's in him right. and then by his resurrection from the dead. Exactly. So according to, to Psalm 2, why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. I'll just stop right there. I like that next verse. He says, let us break their bands asunder 
and cast away their cords from us. And that's what humanity is trying to do to what today. They're right. trying to break off the cords off of them. Yeah, and it says that he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall, ha shall have them in derision. So the wrath of God is coming. And as said before, this can't be reversed. You know, that, that verse that points me to the fact, hey, God's not up there taking aspirin. He's not up there biting his fingernails what's going on earth. He's He's got it all under control. He's just sitting back laughing at his, his us little tiny creation and think that we're going to come against him one day. Yes. I'm, I'm even sorry to cut off the verse right there or the, the passage. It says, then he shall speak unto them in his wrath yep. and vex them in his sore displeasure. So, and so it's so incredible to me. And I, I, I do not believe that some of these writers don't know what they're writing about. Okay. Right. It, it, is ironic to me that the time before the rapture, we get a gigantic movie about the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ironic because no one, uh, depend, depending on your position, um, our position is pre-trib, uh, and we believe in the imminency uh, of the rapture, meaning it can happen at any moment, 30 seconds from now, two years from now, whenever it happens. But if you're on a position of the mid-trib or the post-trib, according to these New Age writers and the demons they're channeling, mid-trib or post-trib is wiped out. <laughs> because they know what's coming, and they know that they're going to set up this antichrist system after the rapture happens. They don't know when it's coming exactly. No one knows. And that's declared in the word. No one knows the day or the hour. But these demonic spirits no scripture and they twist it to fool people that want a physical appearance of some godlike being to give a message out to the world and some of this will be covered in my documentary but uh, you know this is a good uh conversation and review and um i really hope that everyone listening got something from this that they could take to uh, minister to people warn people about you're equipped now you don't have an excuse <laughs> you know and spread the gospel warn time of the lord is at hand any last words no i, I think i think we've, we've wrapped it up pretty good and like i said this this movie is multifaceted it's, it's just hard to it's hard to take an hour and sit down i think we've been going about an hour and a half now it's, it's hard to sit down and take an hour but, I mean, I think we could have went all night and talked about the, the way this movie goes. But I think you wrapped it up pretty well there that, hey, these people are, you know, in contact way, you know, whether it might be drugs or however they are, you know, with other entities uh, that are letting me in on these things that are soon to come on the show. Yeah, exactly. And um, so if you enjoyed this, please share, share, share. And if you want to... Um, you know, support us any other way. The links are below. Don't let them burn. If you like our videos, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to get all our frequent updates.